Hello, everybody. <clears throat> this is Harvey Mansfield. This is also the program on constitutional government in Harvard's Department of Government. And our, our guest today is Peter Berkowitz. Peter Berkowitz is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Mm -hmm. Recently, he was director of the policy planning staff of the US State Department, a post uh, from which he was also recently ousted by the American, <laughs> American electorate. <laughs> He's gonna talk a little bit about it. Uh, he has uh, an impressive education, one could even say an overeducation. <laughs> BA from Swarthmore in English and an MA from the Hebrew University in philosophy. And he has a JD from Yale Law School and he has a PhD from Yale Department of Political Science. From 1990 to 99, he was uh, an assistant professor at, at Harvard in the government department. Those were golden years. Peter and I uh, taught the history of political philosophy together and we played squash afterwards, which he always won. <laughs> From 1999 to 2006, <laughs> he was a professor at the George Mason School of Law, and after that, uh, he became a senior fellow at Hoover. He writes, uh, he writes, he writes books. Uh, he wrote a book on Nietzsche, Nietzsche, the ethics of an, 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 an immoralist, the ethics of an immoralist that set him up for life. <laughs> and uh, virtue and the meaning of modern liberalism. And he's written after that, uh, I think seven books of edited volumes or collected writings of his. And he has rafts of articles that he writes all the time at Real Clear Politics and just, just about everywhere, <clears throat> I have to say, on the conservative landscape. And what he's going to talk about is uh, he's going to is his recent report as uh, director of the policy planning staff of the State Department, uh, which was a 74 page report on the elements of the China challenge. He also had another report on unalienable rights, but um, we're choosing the, to hear about the China challenge now from Peter. So this is Peter Berkowitz. Harvey, uh, th thank you very much. L long ago, when I first began attending uh, seminars of the program on constitutional government, uh, an, an old timer said to me, watch, the best part of the seminar is Harvey's introduction. <laughs> so, so it remains, I, I, I'll do my best to live up to the uh, introduction. I should also say that, um, I suppose I learned it uh, in, uh, in these seminars long ago that uh, speakers should assume that a third of the participants have, have read the paper, a third have perused it, and a third will have some vague sense of the title, um, which means that the speaker has to operate on several levels at the same time, which is actually sort of like political philosophy and sort of like diplomacy. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna give it a shot. Um, first, what is the policy planning staff? Mo most of you know, but I, I should remind you that we are a small office within the office of the Secretary of State. Uh, our job is to take a, a long-term view of problems. Um, in a way, in a way, we are like, um, we are in the situation that, uh, Hamilton uh, ascribed to the Supreme Court. Uh, we, we, we control neither purse nor sword within the State Department, but we do have a kind of power. Uh, you, could say, uh, you could say judgment. We have direct access to the secretary. The director of the policy planning staff is a senior advisor to the secretary. And this within a, the following within a bureaucracy counts for a great deal. We can send our opinions, our formal notes to the secretary, uncleared, that means unobstructed by other offices, whereas other offices need to have their memos to the secretary cleared by many offices, including our offices, um, including the policy planning office. But when the director of the policy planning staff signs off on a note to the secretary, 
by let's say 2 p.m. on Monday, uh, the note will appear in the secretary's book by 6 a.m. Tuesday. Uh, this, as, this is regarded as, and actually is a form of power within the, the vast bureaucracy in Foggy Bottom. A few words about the, uh, the genesis of this uh, long paper. Uh, Harvey has counted accurately, 74 pages. In his graciousness, he left out that it contains 200 footnotes. Um, but we, wa we, we wanted our claims to be, uh, to be well documented. Um, in addition to uh, writing notes for the secretary, the policy planning staff also from time to time takes on special projects. The report of the uh, Commission on Unalienable Rights, which is the work of a commission, but it was still housed within policy planning staff, I should say a commission chaired by our friend and colleague, Marianne Glendon. Uh, the China Challenge paper is another special project of the policy planning staff. <laughs> what, what was its genesis? Well, I suppose it has three big sources. First, um, I think uh, Secretary of State Pompeo's uh, probably greatest achievement as Secretary of State was reorient, reorienting American foreign policy around the China challenge. Uh, before Donald Trump, actually before Mike Pompeo was named Secretary of State, very few people would have said that China is the, um, is the central issue of American foreign policy. Rex Tillerson didn't say this. President Trump focused on the issue of trade, but it was really uh, Mike Pompeo uh, upon arriving from the CIA within a year uh, was making clear in speeches at home, conversations abroad and speeches abroad uh, that the challenge of the moment, indeed the challenge of the generation was the China challenge. You could hear him make statements like, my first thought upon waking up in the morning and my last thought before going to sleep at night is what to do about China. So uh, I, I, I joined the policy planning staff in January, 2019. I was named director in August, 2019. And I arrived in a moment in which the secretary's ideas had consolidated and I received a kind of informal commander's intent. Help me think about the China challenge. Your job in the policy planning staff in general is to step back, think more broadly. So that was one uh, influence. A second was, uh, of course, George Kennan. Um, it's not required by statute, but I uh, assume that many new directors of the policy planning staff uh, go to school with uh, George Kennan's seminal writings from 19, uh, 1946 and 1947, the long telegram from Moscow uh, and the uh, Mr. Mr. X article that was published in uh, Foreign Affairs, the sources of Soviet conduct. Um, what could a new director of policy planning learn from Kennan's writings in the summer of 2019? Um, a lot. Uh, I was especially struck by, by several um, aspects of his writings. One, both articles insisted that in order to understand the conduct of the Soviet Union, you had to understand the ideas that informed the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. In other words, um, Kennan simply set aside uh, the long-standing dispute within political science, should we be students of interest or should we be, and the logic of the situation, or should we be students of ideas and writings? Um, and he argued, uh, bless his soul, we need to be students of both because we can't understand interests without understanding the ideas that inform them. This will be uh, common sense to you all, but as you well know, uh, that common sense is not common these days. Um, a second aspect of Kennan's writing that had a big impact on me was his insistence that, uh, the, that the Soviets were uh, influenced by not one, but two sets of ideas. Of course, by, he's writing in the mid 1940s, by Marxism, Leninism, by communist ideas. But we wouldn't understand Soviet conduct unless we also understood Russian nationalism and how Russian nationalism uh, 
both fuel the actions of, uh, of the Chinese communists and inflected their understanding of communism. Uh, after all, there's nothing in Marx's writings that insists that the center of a, the socialist international order need be Moscow. The third aspect of uh, Kennan's writings um, uh, that, that greatly influenced me uh, were his two was his conclusion. And you see this conclusion in both writings. One, um, in order to prevail in this great threat to freedom, the United States had to both better educate its citizens about the Soviet challenge and stand up a new generation of, of diplomats and political scientists and historians and economists who, who learned Russian and understood Russian uh, culture and history. Only this would put us in a position to meet, the, to meet the Soviet challenge. By the way, the United States did that in the 1950s, spending hundreds of millions of dollars encouraging the serious study of Soviet Union, Russian language, uh, and more. And finally, Kennan's point, also one he makes at the end of both writings. Um, in order for the United States to prevail, it was necessary, and in fact, the most important uh, step the United States could take would be to live up to the best in its own traditions. To live up to the best in its own traditions. Uh, we students of uh, political philosophy these days are inclined to put that a bit more specifically. Uh, that is to live up to our founding principles and our constitutional uh, traditions. And so, um, so I, I actually regard the, um, uh, the report of the Commission on Unalienable Rights. I hope I mentioned the commission uh, chaired by, by our friend and colleague, Marianne Glendon, as, uh, as part and parcel of, um, uh, of efforts to, to, uh, to meet the China challenge. That, that Secretary Pompeo set in motion. Okay, um, with those preliminaries, let me say, uh, I should mention actually one other preliminary. As we were gearing up to, to write something about the China challenge, as the other bureaus in the department and other advisors to the secretary were working on sh short-term matters. Um, what, what laws should we encourage Congress to adopt? What lawsuits should we, um, uh, should we argue that the Department of Justice should bring? What sanctions should we ask the uh, Treasury Department to impose? Uh, these kinds of matters. We thought we could step back, take the longer view. Um, and by the way, not our aim was not to really say something new about the China challenge, but consolidate and synthesize uh, the writings that had been done recently and, and the work of the Trump administration before us in breaking with the conventional wisdom. To get the project going, I asked each member of the policy planning staff, 22 or 23 members, to write a three to five page memo about Chinese inroads in his or her, uh, in his or her area of expertise. Like the State Department, the policy planning staff has area experts, all the regions of the world, and we call them functional experts, people interested, people who focus on, say, international organizations or science and technology and the environment, so on. So uh, in late, late November, early December of uh, 2019, I received 22 memos. Nobody came back and said, uh, China's not doing anything in my sphere. To the contrary, uh, Everybody came back reporting lots of activity, troubling, illicit, challenging of America's uh, interests in every region. That was one aspect of the reporting that struck me. And another aspect was this. Um, no person, no specialist knew that China was acting so aggressively in all the other areas. And as I looked um, at some of the writings on China, there was no account of uh, the inroads that China was making everywhere. 
experts in Africa knew about Chinese inroads in Africa. Experts in Europe knew about Chinese inroads in Europe, experts in the Middle East, and so on. But an account of China everywhere, uh, this was lacking. So under the influence of Secretary Pompeo's commander's intent, under the influence of uh, George Kennan's achievement in 46 and 47 of bringing the Soviet challenge, Soviet challenge into focus, and under the influence of the work of the policy planning staff, um, we, we conceived the paper that uh, uh, the paper that we're discussing today. The, the paper has five parts. Um, the first part, an introduction, uh, examines the conventional wisdom about China. Uh, and explains why it's what why the conventional wisdom uh, held us under its spell for so long, and how we ought to think about China. What was the conventional wisdom about China? Well, since uh, the Kissinger Nixon overture of the seventies, since um, the CCP's opening of the the economy in the late nineteen seventies, early nineteen eighties, the dominant opinion in the United States has and in the West has been. China is on the road to becoming a great power. China is loosening up its economy. As we all know from political science, economic liberalization of necessity brings political liberalization. All we need to do is encourage China, engage China, incorporate China into the international organizations, nudge here and there. And eventually uh, China will um, become I think in the words of Robert Zolek from the early 2000s, uh, become a responsible stakeholder in the international system. Um, th this belief was, uh, I think, fueled by various versions of the, uh, the end of history thesis made famous by uh, Francis Fukuyama, who incidentally published his, uh, his famous national interest piece when he was deputy director in the policy planning staff. Um, as you all know, we don't have time to go into it. There is an empirical and philosophical dimension of it. But the thesis that made uh, had an impact worldwide was that the world was tending toward liberal democracy. We might be able to nudge it a bit th this moment or that, but uh, the process was uh, underway. Um, <clears throat> why? What informed, especially when it applied to China, this misguided understanding? Well, um, was helped by the uh, assumption that all nation states are roughly like the United States, driven by the same interest, the same interpretation of interest. And that, by the way, we needn't pay any attention to Chinese ideas about their interests, their objectives, their aims, the proper shape of internal governments, the proper structure of international order. Because of these general dynamics, and even if we're not subject to the um, uh, we're not captured by the end of history uh, thesis. We're uh, good students of, um, we should be good students of international affairs. And either as realists, we know that Chinese conduct is governed by uh, um, uh, iron laws of the uh, chess table, um, or we're liberal internationalists. And we know the pull of international institutions will tame authoritarian powers. All the while though, from Mao through Xi, Chinese leaders of, the, uh, leaders of the Chinese Communist Party have been insisting Marxism-Leninism is absolutely essential to uh, the prospering of China. The Chinese patriotism, yes, patriotism, consists in devotion to country, to, country, to party, and to socialism. The di dictatorship uh, under Marxist, Marxist Leninism principles is non-negotiable. And the national rejuvenation, this is a, a Xi Jinping term, national rejuvenation culminates in the transformation of the international order. Um, that is to transform the free open rules-based international order that the United States helped bring into existence after World War II into an order one can, uh, we can debate the particulars, but in order that is significantly more friendly to authoritarian government, um, in which other countries don't issue finding of genocide when you are imprisoning, let's say, one million Turkic, Mus Turkic Muslims in 
concentration camps. So I can summarize the, uh, uh, on the basis of this correction of the conventional wisdom, I can summarize the China, China challenge as we came to see it in the policy planning staff. That is, as we gave articulation to, um, to the view that Secretary Pompeo was championing around the world, or that he was explaining around the world and on its basis calling, uh, calling people to the side of freedom, calling nations to the side of freedom. China is not merely a great power um, that seeks preeminence within its domain, its region. It is a great power that seeks to transform the international order, placing Beijing in the center. Um, that's the China challenge in short. As I said, uh, as I've indicated, policy planning staff paper um, did not discover this transformation. We don't claim to uh, push forward the frontiers of knowledge, as, uh, as I know you ask of graduate students. We sought to synthesize um, knowledge that was out there uh, we took advantage of several writings that had already been published by the Trump administration, beginning with the important uh, 2017 national security strategy that was drafted under the supervision of, of my now colleague at, uh, at the Hoover Institution, H.R. McMaster. So China challenge. Uh, we believe that China is actually making a, uh, a credible threat to succeed in its transformation of, of international order, order and doing so across several domains. Which domains or what, what are the elements of China's conduct? First is dictatorship at home. As I've mentioned, the CCP uh, maintains one party repressive dictatorship. And by the way, it's worth pausing to uh, emphasize before Mike Pompeo was named Secretary of State, almost nobody in public discourse referred to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, we might refer to China, but the Chinese Communist Party does not um, hide its name, hide its designation, is not embarrassed about its communism. Indeed, it, it, it shouts to the rafters its pride in being communist. It deplores the collapse of the Soviet Union. It, uh, she has said time and again, we have to learn from the collapse of the Soviet Union. When we're now in a way, we, uh, China, country of 1.4 billion, billion people, in a sense, we're isolated as the last great champion of communism. So in referring to the CCP, I want to emphasize, I'm, uh, I'm not only doing the Chinese the courtesy of uh, the Chinese Communist Party of doing them the courtesy of referring to them as they refer to themselves. So one aspect of, contact, of um, China's conduct is, is a dictatorship at home. This dictatorship receives expression not only in one person rule, but in erection of uh, the largest, most intrusive surveillance state in human history, uh, in the oppression of ethnic and religious minorities, starting with, uh, I've mentioned, uh, the Uyghurs in Western, uh, Western China. It's also six million Tibetans who are uh, deprived of the opportunity speak their traditional language, practice uh, their religion. Same goes for ethnic Mongols in uh, northeastern regions of China and for some, um, for some 70 million uh, Christians in, uh, in China. Um, and we also see the dictatorship in, uh, in China's crushing of freedom in, uh, in Hong Kong last spring, uh, incursions in the South China Sea making uh, claims in, in brazen defiance of international law about its territorial rights and in its menacing of, uh, of Taiwan. China at home. But there's also the uh, China abroad. And as I've already indicated, for Xi, um, transformation of the international order is the culmination of national rejuvenation. We identified uh, six or seven schemes, programs that China has, has been using abroad in order to uh, achieve preeminence, in order to advance its imperial, uh, in order to advance its imperial ambitions. What, for example? Well, let's start with intellectual property theft. Um, uh, the United States estimates that the Chinese steal in the neighborhood of $600 billion a year of intellectual property. 
probably uh, in Chinese uh, intellectual property theft probably counts as the greatest um, uh, greatest act of theft in human history. Uh, China seeks, and this came into focus for many people uh, last year as a result of the global pandemic. China seeks to uh, control global su supply chains and essential goods. Um, China seeks uh, dominance in key industries for the 21st century uh, high-tech economy. China uh, seeks to establish itself as the provider of choice for um, uh, 5G and physical Belt Road Initiative is not simply designed to enable China to trans transport goods um, now not only through Central Asia and uh, the Indo-Pacific in Europe, but, but around the world, the projects, BNI uh, projects, um, port, airports, seaports, bridges, roads, uh, now civil nuclear reactors, all of this, these are also de designed to induce economic dependence on uh, the nations in which these projects are built, and bring them within uh, China's sphere. Uh, ch uh, China also uh, typically enjoys, certainly in the United States, all but unfettered access to our security markets, which allows it to become, uh, um, we, which allows its national champion co uh, companies to systematically violate our laws. And of course, um, China uses the freedom of liberal democracies against them. One, uh, from our point of view, notorious example of this is the rise of Confucius Institutes on university campuses. University uh, Confucius Institutes, of course, uh, are organizations um, which are emanations of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, they are often accompanied by big payments to the universities in exchange for the universities um, uh, refraining from making mean statements about the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it's very important for the United States to be encouraging the, the serious study of Chinese, of Mandarin, the serious study of Chinese culture and history. Um, uh, Opening our campuses, being bribed by the Confucius Institutes to create places for them, our campuses, is not the way. In addition, uh, Chinese uh, diplomacy has been very aggressive within uh, international organizations, seeking posi positions of, uh, of leadership, installing their people wherever they can, and subtly and not so subtly, attempting to change the norms and the standards of these international organizations to, again, make them more friendly to, um, to authoritarianism. Uh, I, I haven't mentioned yet, I should also another part of China's conduct, which is very important, China's military. For decades, it has been the ambition of the uh, Chinese Communist Party to develop a quote, world-class military, close quote. Um, they believe they have not yet achieved their, um, they're not yet where they want to be in the military sphere, but I think it's fair to say that they already have a world-class uh, military. Uh, they represent um, a, uh, an imposing force within the South China Sea, not only because of the positions they've been building, but because of their naval capacities, their missile capacities. Um, they're a serious threat also in spheres of, uh, in the nuclear sphere, the cyber sphere, and aer out, out, outer space. Um, those are the main elements of China's conduct. But to really understand this, the pattern of their conduct around the world, what their, what their larger aim is, how this pattern, how these very elements of their conduct serve their interests as they understand them. As I've mentioned, you have to understand uh, the Chinese sensibility and you have to understand also Chinese ideas. By the way, this is not, uh, my imposition or the policy planning staff's imposition or Secretary of State Pompeo's imposition. Xi Jinping's speeches and writings fill three thick volumes. It is Xi Jinping, from Xi Jinping all the way back to Mao, they insist on the indispensableness of ideas. They refer mostly to Marxism, Leninism, but one can see interspersed there. Um, an extreme interpretation of Chinese nationalism. They insist on the necessity of, uh, of understanding their interests through the lens of the ideas to which they're committed. So we see in the CCP a sensibility 
that is authoritarian, that's collectivist and imperial. As I've said, uh, two streams of thought influence it, Marxism, Leninism, Chinese nationalism. But um, I do not want to suggest that uh, as some people do, some, some critics, some Chinese hawks, some China hawks do, that somehow uh, this sensibility is the, the inevitable expression of, of Chinese culture, Chinese civilization. First, it's very important, as Secretary Pompeo always did, to distinguish between the CCP and the Chinese people. Um, but second, um, we've actually run the experiment um, in, 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 uh, in the Indo-Pacific. We know that uh, uh, people steeped in Confucian, Confucian civilization needn't choose authoritarianism. How do we know that? Because we look to Hong Kong, we look to Taiwan, we look to South Korea, we look to Japan, uh, but especially uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, steeped in Confucian culture, not less than um, the 1.4 billion of China, and they chose uh, freedom and democracy. So the argument we've made is not one of um, historical or philosophical necessity. At the same time, we begin with the fact that the ruling party, ruling party brought into being the People's Republic of China, uh, constantly affirms its commitment to this set of ideas, and it's worth our while to, um, to study these ideas. Um, because time's running on, uh, I, I won't go into too much detail, uh, simply to say that um, many of you are um, undoubtedly observing that I, I am coupling, as Kennan did, nationalism with communism. And of course, um, we tend to understand these as uh, conflicting schools of thought or ideologies. After all, communism teaches the, uh, actually teaches the, um, the necessity of the emergence of an international order of um, free and equal people. Uh, sometimes uh, described as the universal classless society, whereas nationalism favors a particular people. It wants to champion and preserve a particular language, a particular culture, a particular civilization, that of a people who share a common sense of political destiny. How's that reconciled? Well, the Chinese reconcile it, the Chinese Communist Party reconcile it the same way that the Soviets did or in parallel fashion. Um, the Chinese aspire to an international order. They sometimes speak gently of uh, the common destiny uh, of mankind, but that, that's consistent with uh, the communist dream. That's con consistent with many strands of socialism, but it's a, um, it, it's a communism which places not, not only Beijing in the center, as you know, there's nothing in Marxism, Leninism that insists that Beijing must be the center of an authoritarian world order, but also this, um, this international order must be friendly to China's uh, national interests. So for example, there is nothing in uh, Marxism, Leninism that says that Hong Kong uh, always has been and must remain an integral part of China. Nothing in Marxism and Leninism that says that about um, Taiwan and nothing about in Marxism and Leninism that's, uh, well, I, I, I will stop there. There is something in Marxism, Leninism that demands the, uh, that the uh, central dictatorship purge religious belief of, from uh, out of all people who hold it. Okay. So, uh, so China's conduct is informed by the synthesis of Chinese nationalism and Marxist-Leninist ideas. Um, it would be a mistake to present China as all-powerful. Its population is four times the size of the United States. It has enjoyed double-digit economic growth going on um, uh, uh, for decades. But like all countries, China suffers uh, from certain vulnerabilities. Some of the Chinese vulnerabilities, we take this up in part four of the paper, are endemic to all authoritarian governments. Eventually, usually uh, uh, 
uh, sooner rather than later. Authoritarian governments have difficulty with innovation and correction, self-correction. Um, it's difficult when uh, one people or a single party are calling all the shots to, uh, for dissenters and critics to arise, for creative people to um, successfully pursue new ways of, um, of building, of organizing, uh, engaging in diplomacy, so on. The second endemic, uh, that brings us to the second endemic problem of all, all authoritarian governments, alliances. Down through history, um, you will see that authoritarian governments have difficulty maintaining friendships and alliances. That seems to have something to do with their, um, with their untrustworthiness and viciousness. Um, and third, authoritarian, it's, it is expensive to run authoritarian governments. Now it's true, uh, as, as we learned from, uh, from our studies of political philosophy, that uh, while the best regime may be um, a benevolent monarch, benevolent authoritarianism, um, actual authoritarian governments tend not to be benevolent, tend not, tend not to, um, despite the pro protestations, govern in the interests of the people. And eventually the people get the clue. The result is that, uh, that authoritarian governments generally and for the most part uh, have to go to great expense to, um, uh, to keep down a restive population, which takes money away from the economy, takes money away from um, um, military adventures abroad. Those problems afflict all authoritarian governments. Uh, the Chinese, uh, the People's Republic of China suffers specific vulnerabilities, economic instability, um, demogra demographic imbalance because of uh, the one child policy economic degradation um, uh, because of its industrial policy, political corruption, because that's what you get with Marxist-Leninist uh, parties, the oppression of minorities, which, uh, which I've discussed. Um, and uh, there's also the problem of the army, which is not the army of the people, but an army of the party. And last, but certainly not least now, uh, mounting indignation, resentment and ang anger around the world as a result of the Chinese Communist Party's uh, uh, covering up of the, uh, the virus born or made in Wuhan and its concerted disinformation campaign throughout 2020 and continuing um, now. Uh, I I'm gonna end uh, with final statement about part five, which is entitled Securing Freedom. Um, one, one point is that um, I've drawn some comparisons to the Soviet challenge. There's at least one huge difference. The Soviet challenge was uh, primarily, or I should put it differently, the Soviets primarily exercised power in the military sphere. They held roughly half of uh, Europe in dominion uh, at the edge of the sword. The China primarily, though not exclusively, exclusive, exercises its power in the economic sphere. They have an economy uh, whose size and power influence dwarfs anything the Soviets could have imagined. That makes the Soviet, the China challenge, I think uh, um, much more difficult than the, uh, than, the, than the Soviet challenge. Finally, the paper ends with um, 10 tasks that we believe that um, the United States must undertake to refashion its foreign policy, to prepare itself to meet the China challenge. Happy to discuss them here. I only emphasize that um, um, we didn't attempt to say anything new. Once again, consolidate what we already knew. We place heavy emphasis on securing freedom at home and therefore heavy emphasis on uh, educating for freedom, uh, which, um, which involves um, controversies about uh, our schools, which involves training up a new uh, uh, diplomatic corps, we do not um, uh, diminish the significance of a thriving economy, the world's most sophisticated uh, military, um, the, need for, uh, the need for alliances abroad, the difficulties of cooperating with a great power, China, that as the State 
department uh, officially found on January 19th, just committing uh, genocide. We don't, uh, we don't underestimate those challenges at all. We emphasize them. But as Kenan pointed out in 46, 47, um, uh, to meet the challenge of the day, we're going to have to live up to the best in our traditions. Uh, I've gone on too long, Harvey and Anna, but I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Peter. Yeah, we have lots of questions. Um, David right. Epstein, please, and then Jack Goldsmith. Um, thank you. Hello, Peter. Good to see you. Hi, David. Uh, Good to see you. I wanted to encourage you to explicate this statement that China primarily pursues the configuration, the reconfiguration of world affairs through economic power. And you distinguish economic power from the Soviet case of military power. And I think a little surprisingly to me, say the economic power is a bigger problem or more difficult than Soviet military power. I mean, I would have thought economic power is important as a source of military power uh, through technology and military spending, but it seems that you're arguing that economic coercion in itself is the primary Chinese means. And I wonder, given what political scientists and economists have found about the effectiveness of economic coercion in US experience, which is generally that it's not effective, um, is this actually a, a, a plausible project for the Chinese? I mean, maybe, maybe they think of it this way, but yeah. is economic power really going to reconfigure world affairs? Uh, but then the other part is, what does it mean to reconfigure world affairs? I mean, you mentioned getting people to stop criticizing them, but when you say imperial ambition, that sounds like much more. Than, uh, than gaining respectful speech from others. Um, so I wondered how far the world really will be or could be reconfigured by Chinese economic coercion. Yes, it's a, it, it's a great question and our two part question. Um, and sure, it's, it's quite possible, um, I wouldn't count on it, that the, the Chinese efforts will collapse under their, their own weight. Countries will uh, push back. Um, countries will join the United States in the effort to, uh, to secure freedom. But, but there's reason to, to remain worried. And again, when, when you're talking, let's go back to your first question about uh, the power, uh, uh, economic power. I think when you're talking about the, um, limitations of American economic power, I'm talking about uh, foreign aid, financial assistance designed to encourage uh, other countries to, um, to adopt our ways and our norms. Well, sure, but what we're talking about with the Chinese uh, Communist Party is, uh, is something on a, on a massive scale. Um, the, Chinese, the Chinese economy is bound up with uh, other economies around the world, in, in ways that the Soviet Union never was. They're a massive trading partner for all of the world's major economies. Um, and as a result, they have tremendous influence over these countries, including over the United States. Right now, China exercises power on our university campuses. They exercise power in Hollywood, censoring uh, Disney and other, uh, other movies. They, they exercise enough power to compel the general manager of uh, the Houston Rockets basketball team um, to, uh, or the, the NBA to effectively retract a uh, four or five word tweet, which expressed uh, support for those fighting for freedom and democracy in, uh, in Hong Kong. So uh, I think the evidence is, uh, considerable that the Chinese are already exercising serious influence in the internal politics of, um, of countries around the world. Moreover, the, the Chinese through BRI and, and through efforts to become 5G providers of choice are uh, uh, achieving something um, that the, the Soviets couldn't, didn't. The, the, the Chinese are in the process of creating just a surveillance state within China, but a surveillance international order. 
as you know, uh, uh, more than I do, uh, military civil fusion, Chinese national champions like Huawei and ZTE, um, develop software, develop infrastructure, which poses the danger that, uh, that routine and not so routine um, communications in countries around the world will uh, um, supply data for the, for the CCP, massive amounts of data. These massive amounts of data will enable the uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, to become, to, to uh, take great leaps forward in, uh, in artificial intelligence and uh, add to their, their, their hegemonic ambitions. So, um, so I see uh, all kinds of uh, threats there. And so what kind of transformations of the international order? Well, um, how about international organizations that, um, uh, that cooperate with uh, the Chinese Communist Party in, uh, in, covering up, um, in, in covering up the unleashing of a, uh, of a global pandemic that support the Chinese Communist Party, even as the Chinese Communist Party is cutting off all flights from, uh, um, from Wuhan Bay province to the rest of China, while allowing flights from the province to, to all around the world. Um, these changes uh, um, uh, don't happen all at once. They're not dramatic. They, well, this one is dramatic. Some of the changes are not dramatic, um, but uh, like the, the famous uh, Asian board game that is, uh, uh, goes under the uh, Japanese name Go, but I believe originated in China, I think what we're seeing in the international order is a um, slow but steady accumulation of positions, which uh, ultimately could result, if we're not uh, more vigilant and uh, don't take serious action, in an international order which has its center of gravity in Beijing. I'll stop there. Thank you, Jack, please. Hi, Peter. Hey, Jack, how's it going? Fine, good to see you. Um, so not much in your list of things China is doing to try to assert itself on the global stage was very surprising. I mean, they're increased in, in terms of what great what young great powers do. They're trying to increase their international economic influence, their international military influence. They're trying to control international organizations. That's what we did to great profit uh, after World War II. Um, now, there's a big difference with them controlling it as opposed to us controlling it. The global surveillance order you were just talking about is something that we, in documents that were once secret and now revealed, thought we once had and were bragging about uh, uh, inside the government. And now there's a competition over that. Um, but the one thing that seems different to me is the massive uh, um, economic theft, uh, what, you, what you called commercial theft and I would call you thought you called IP theft, and I would call it commercial espionage to something broader. In the United States, when it was a rising country, it didn't respect foreign intellectual property rights, but nothing, it was just different in that. And that's, again, what growing powers do, but nothing at all on the scale of this. I mean, the internet has really in, had a huge distributional impact in, in, in enabling China to just for decades now. Uh, we've been, for 15 years, we've been talking about it publicly. The Obama administration did basically nothing about it. There was the, the Xi agreement, the soft agreement in 2015, which was broken as soon as it was made. They had some wrist slapping sanctions. The Trump administration, to its credit, did a lot about it. And I would put it in two baskets. One, a lot of the trade sanctions and even some of the um, global supply chain sanctions were justified in part, I think the message got muddled a little bit, were justified in part on, on uh, you know, imposing costs for the IP theft uh, and the National Security Agency or Cyber Command with the new Defend Forward strategy was openly much more aggressive at trying to check these activities at the source. And yet, despite the fact, and yet my, my question is, I don't think we're having any impact or at least it's not obvious that we're having an impact. This seems to me to be a problem that we can't solve because I think the benefits to the Chinese are just much, much greater than any sanctions we're able to impose because they just continued all through the Trump administration, at least if you believe what you read in the newspapers, and I'm sure, I suspect it's worse than what one reads in the newspapers. There's just continuing and ramping up of, uh, of 
commercial property theft. And, and, and I'm not even talking about on the government side. So my, I guess my question is, could you say more about that and how serious a problem this, what you call IP theft, and I think of as commercial espionage is? Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm at the point where I don't think that there's anything at all we can do about it. And it has the feature of being the type of thing that in the legal structure is below um, what's called below the threshold in the international law parlance, which means there are only certain things we can do lawfully in response. So could you just comment on that in general about how big a problem this is and how much progress was made? Yeah, I, I'll comment in general, but uh, um, but your, your, your comments and your question distress me because um, the truth is, you know a lot more than I do about what uh, actually we, we could do, an expert in, in this area. And it's distressing to learn that, um, um, uh, to have reaffirmed from you how massive the problem is and how limited our capabilities are. So um, thanks, you know, I, I think you're right. The, um, the Trump administration also gets credit, Secretary Pompeo especially, um, for measures that were, uh, were begun. But again, uh, his biggest achievement was reorientation. And the reorientation was not only at home, but it was abroad. Um, he logged lots of miles. And the constant theme was the China challenge, not least uh, this aspect, commercial property theft, the danger of Huawei and ZTE, the unreliable unreliability of the Chinese Communist Party. So um, I can speak in, in broader terms. Uh, undoubtedly, one aspect of dealing with this um, this theft, which represents, uh, I think we agree, an enormous national security threat, is um, securing agreement from nations around the world, friends, allies, and partners, that we have a serious problem. So, um, you know, um, it is charged that the, uh, um, just as it was charged that the uh, Bush administration, Bush 43, in which you served, shredded the constitution, it is charged that the Trump administration shredded our allies. We turned our back on our allies. But the truth is, uh, especially if you look to the Indo-Pacific, uh, the, uh, the Trump administration, Secretary Pompeo's leadership, significantly strengthened uh, our alliances in the, uh, the Indo-Pacific. The Quad comprising US, Australia, Japan, and India stronger than it had, stronger than it's ever been. Bilateral relations, at least when we left office, were stronger than they uh, had ever been. And what strengthened it? Um, obviously, not merely um, Trump administration diplomacy, but the recognition on the part of the Japanese, the Australians, and the Indians of the gravity and the urgency of uh, the China challenge. Um, Keith Kroc, Undersecretary Energy, um, traveled around the world, uh, helping create something called the Clean Network. It's a start. This is now when I think when we left office, some 50 countries uh, and more companies had, had agreed um, not to do business with unreliable providers, read the Chinese Communist Party. Um, again, uh, you know a lot more than I do about whether, um, whether that's merely for show and grandstanding or whether that is whether that constitutes uh, a significant first step. So as far as significant uh, second steps, I'm sure I don't have anything to add on specific policies, but what I, what I can add is that uh, the United States can certainly, under the Biden administration, can certainly follow in the footsteps of the Trump administration by continuing the process of education, not only of the American people, I've been, been reproached for this, I should not speak of the United States educating friends, allies, and partners, but expressing forcefully our view to friends, allies, and partners that um, uh, protecting our digital future is an essential aspect of securing the international order and securing freedom. Jack, would you like to follow up on that? Um, okay, then we have Mark Landy and Jeffrey Bristol, please. Mark, you gotta unmute yourself. I'm following up on your initial comment about the conventional wisdom, right? Yes. 
we all know, quote unquote, we all know that political liberalization is necessary for really, for really impressive economic growth. And I hear all this about um, prop, you know, intellectual property theft, but I think if the Soviets had stolen our intellectual property, they wouldn't have had this incredible. So what explains it? Why, why is this perhaps the only case in modern history of a repressive regime really succeeding economically? Yes, well, um... We should quali qualify the point about uh, the Soviets first. Actually, initially, the Soviets enjoyed a fair amount of success. It turns out, uh, to borrow from Mao, at the barrel of, uh, at the end of the barrel of a gun, you can remove peasants from the countryside and put them in factories and uh, contribute to production. But we learned from the Soviet cases, you can't sustain that. Um, the CCP has had, a, has had an incredible run. Um, and we should be, it seems to me, we should be careful here. Um, critics of the conventional wisdom are liable to, um, you know, we are gleefully point our fingers. Political scientists are wrong. Economic liberalism doesn't of necessity bring political liberalization. <clears throat> but it also could be um, too, uh, too early to tell about the instabilities within Chinese society. So um, uh, now an anecdote. Yesterday, I, I, I was meeting with um, some students, a meeting that had been delayed for 13 months, but we, we finally met. Um, one of the students is a woman from, uh, born in Shanghai, a remarkable woman. She, she left China uh, when she was 18 or 19, got a bachelor's degree at Rice, and is about to complete, she's 28 or 29, a joint degree in uh, medicine and business at Stanford. Yeah, impressive woman. And uh, she, we got to talking afterward and I, I told her about the, we spoke more about the work of the policy planning staff. And I, I was explaining to her that, you know, there's schools of opinion about um, the ideas that, uh, uh, that, that inform the Chinese Communist Party. One school takes uh, Marxism, Leninism very seriously. This was a, a polite and demure woman. She guffawed, guffawed at that first option, Marxism, Leninism seriously. O on her account, no one believes the stuff, uh, which is not to say that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't govern in the spirit of Marxism, Leninism. But she's to be trusted, and there's plenty more evidence that a gap is opened up. So what allows the CCP to continue to rule as it does? Um, a deal, an unwritten deal with the people. We will bring about, double continue to bring about double-digit growth and um, full employment, at least for the 380 million or so who have entered the middle class. And in exchange, We'll surveil you and you'll hear about Xi Jinping thought and you'll only encounter Marxism, Leninism, but you'll, um, you'll, you'll, you'll keep on with business. Okay, so that, that's to say there may be instabilities, but still you, um, you ask the question, what, why is this case at least for 40 years been different? Uh, it may have something to do with traditional Chinese culture. After all, we find in traditional Chinese culture, um, we certainly find a statism which says that uh, things need to be controlled from the center. Uh, we see a legalism that, um, uh, that says that the, the criminal law uh, has to be used to keep people in place and for the greater glory of the state. It has to be aggressive and intrusive. And we see a commitment to bureaucracy, commitment to bureaucracy um, that, that goes back to 2000 years which we use tests to find, uh, to, to help um, people and maintain the elite. Well, the statism, this legalism, this commitment to bureaucracy deeply entrenched within Chinese society um, may, have, may have contributed as it did in South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, just guessing. But I, but I do, wanna, do want to um, emphasize that as much as the um, 
the China's extraordinary achievements over the last 40 years have called into question the economic liberalization uh, must produce political uh, liberalization. One does see cracks and 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 fissures, and it seems to me one's one's not entitled to build a foreign policy around it, but one's entitled to wonder, uh, especially in the age of the internet, especially in the age of images of freedom and democracy. Um, as, as the Chinese middle class grows richer, as they have even more disposable income, as they grow accustomed to uh, more and more freedom in the economic sphere, um, might they not want more freedom in the, uh, uh, in the political sphere? And moreover, there's one other uh, aspect of the economic puzzle we have to keep in mind. Um, let's say, that the middle class continues to be co-opted uh, within China. And I've already mentioned China has the largest, has a middle class that's larger than the entire United States. On the other hand, China has a peasant class that's almost double the size of the United States. There's still some 600 million Chinese who live roughly on the equivalent of $140 a month. Um, as they see prosperity in Beijing and Shanghai, and others of uh, China's mega cities. Um, what, what kind of uh, consequences will that have for, uh, for stability in, in China? So um, it's, been, it's been a great 40 year run and it seems to me the United States reasonably has to prepare for um, a, a long-term struggle, but we also need to take into account that this uh, Chinese um, uh, e economic success uh, or um, Past results are not a guarantee of uh, future success. Thank you so much. That's great answer. Uh, thanks. Okay, Jeffrey Bristol, then James Hankins, Avi Nelson, Tom Palmer. We have a lot of questions. Wow. Yeah. Well, uh, so I just I just got a question for you, Peter. I, one of the things that I always find interesting about China, I think some people are interested in political philosophy, and it's kind of a continuation of what you're saying in answer to the last question is it, the incredible impoverishment of political philosophy in China, which, you know, I, it seems to be a huge obstacle in the foreign realm to me. You know, like the Soviet Union was able to use revolutionary socialism to leverage all kinds of movements across the world. It was able to hide activities that were self-serving and get people on board against their interests by saying, hey, this is revolutionary socialism, jump on board, you know, we're fulfilling the dialectic of history, right? And China seems not interested in developing any kind of a political philosophy, you know, on a national level other than Xi Jinping thought, which is, you know, kind of an amorphous thing that to me doesn't seem like it has much appeal to anybody who's outside of what you mentioned, this kind of deal between the China dream, between Xi Jinping and, and the people. And so, you know, I mean, you kind of have some confusion. What I think is interesting is you have glimmerings of Confucius thought, right? You have even political philosophers, I'm trying to remember the name of it, I think it's somebody at Harvard, uh, publishing books now on Confucianism as an alternative to, you know, Western democracy and this kind of thing. It doesn't seem like China, despite the fact they have Confucius Institutes, is adopting any of this as a, as a mainline thing. So I'm just wondering, what is the ultimate impact of this? Why is China not doing it? And is this ultimately going to put its expansionism in the international sphere in jeopardy as people really just view it as a transactional relationship and start saying, without a philosophy, without a real reason, without an idea to export, you know, what do you have and, 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 and what's going on? Well, again, uh, good question. You know, I, I think the reason that political philosophy is not flourishing in China is the um, same reason it's not flourishing in Venezuela, Cuba, and it didn't flourish in the Soviet Union. Communist parties, um, communist parties think they have the final answer on all things economic, social, political, and cultural. There's nothing, le nothing left to learn. Um, in parentheses, I should say, and uh, I know Harvey and uh, Anna know more about this than I, I do. I know there is, uh, there's some kind of small percolating interest in the writings of Leo Strauss in, uh, in the universities of China. But in general, of course, the authorities are hostile. Um, they're hostile to alternatives. 
there's certainly hostile to alternatives that encourage uh, citizens to think for themselves. Uh, that, that excludes right there classical political philosophy and the modern tradition of freedom. Um, uh, what else did I want to say? Um, um, I, I've lost my uh, train of thought for a minute. Just to state the, the nub of the question again. Um, yeah, I mean, oh, what, yeah, political philosophy and, and, and why it's not, not being developed. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Con Confucius. I want to say something about Confucius. So um, I was about to say that our universities do a disservice by, but then I realized I could finish the sentence in a thousand and one different ways. Uh, our universities do so many disservices, beginning with their failure to teach, apart from Harvey, many honorable, a few honorable exceptions, um, to teach the tradition of political philosophy, to treat, teach the American constitutional tradition. But by the way, we are also now doing a disservice by not teaching Chinese civilization. Um, the, for example, the Analects of Confucius, by the way, not a long book, uh, about the size of the prince, um, makes for very instructive reading. Uh, on the one hand, it is utterly incompatible with Marxism-Leninism. Yes, you could say there's a collectivist dimension to it, but it's clear that, um, for example, that Confucian philosophy um, uh, insists that the aim of political order is the promotion of virtue, that uh, the ruler must rule for the advantage of the people, not for his own advantage, um, that uh, the moral exemplar is, for lack of a better term, but this is the term used in, in one of the leading translations, is the gentleman who cultivates in himself moral and intellectual virtue in others around him. Um, there are plenty of resources within uh, traditional Confucian teaching to provide standards um, against which the, the Chinese Communist Party could find, be find, found not only wanting, but um, shameful usurpers. So, um, uh, and, and the, Ch the Chinese, um, the CCP, of course, suppress, officially suppresses Confucian thought, even as in practice, they build on uh, traditions from within Confucian civilization. So, um, so sure, the, it, it ought to be a part of uh, US foreign policy, not only to be giving uh, speeches, championing freedom abroad, but also championing traditional Chinese civilization, encouraging the people of China uh, to turn to it, expressing our respect for uh, thousands of years old, uh, a great civilization. But to, to summarize, it's no surprise. It is part of the Marxist-Leninist playbook to uh, suppress the political philosophy. In fact, it's part of the uh, playbook to suppress all thought that, uh, that potentially deviates from, um, from the regime's tenets, which is to say all thought. Jim, this is your moment, Harvard scholar. <laughs> Unmute yeah. yourself. Yeah, I wanted to say I don't agree that there is no Confucian political philosophy in China, and that it's not in actually rather strong contrast with Marxism and Leninism, which no one believes in China. Um, it's it's like uh, so. Um, there are thousands of Chinese political philosophers who are in the Confucian tradition. Uh, they're across the spectrum. Uh, you can find people in Hong Kong, many people in Hong Kong and other parts of the Chinese world who would maintain that China Confucianism is compatible with liberal democracy. Uh, the two leading political theorists in mainland China are both advocates of local democracy, but meritocracy in the higher uh, spheres of government at the higher levels of bureaucracy. Uh, the, it is uh, it's perfectly compatible. Uh, I, I think that it's a generational thing in part that the old guard is holding on to their Marxism-Leninism, uh, but the younger people are hoping for a substitution. Uh, when I was in uh, lecturing in, in Qingdao, 
and being hosted by the uh, <clears throat> by the, um, the dean of the School of Public Administration at Shandong University, which is the university that is most in support of Confucianism, uh, Daniel Bell. Um, I was introduced to his assistant dean, who's a man named Kong, turns out to be a 75th generation descendant of Confucius and has the family certificate on his wall to prove that he has a place in the Confucian cemetery in Tsufu. Uh, anyway, um, he goes and lectures at the, at the Central Party School every month on Confucian political thought to Chinese uh, intellectuals who are party intellectuals. Uh, Xi Jinping plays a lot of lip service to Confucianism, as you probably know. Uh, Confucius is included in middle school textbooks and pre pretty much all textbooks have got their little Confucian box of sayings. But there is a serious um, effort to, uh, to, to battle what's considered the legalism of, of Marxist-Leninist thought and also the foreignness of Marxist-Leninist thought, which is not Chinese. Uh, and even if it has Chinese characteristics, it's widely perceived as being a Western import. And to make Chinese political philosophy more Chinese, which I think would be an excellent outcome for us. I don't think we're gonna make China into a liberal democracy. And furthermore, I think we're in a very poor position right now to be exporting liberal democracy since the elites in the United States are opposed to both liberalism and democracy. Um, this is something that's quite different from the Cold War with Russia where there was a real ideological struggle going on between liberal democracy and Marxism. I think in the current world, our system is much closer to the Chinese system that's controlled by a wealthy oligarchy and who's not very interested in personal freedom uh, and is interested in, um, in uh, control, of, uh, control of thought control, tyrannical thought control. I think we have that in both our country and in China. But I do think that, that uh, Confucian political philosophy, uh, where it's not a puppet of the state, and it sometimes is, but where it's not a puppet of the state does have some, uh, we, we do, it does offer some hope for, for uh, liberalizing China in a, in a Chinese way. Um, well, thanks for that. that that's very helpful. I, I, I can't agree that, um, there is a kind of tyrannical thought control in the United States comparable to, um, uh, to, to what's taking place in China, e even as I'm greatly, greatly worried about um, the myriad assaults on, uh, on, on free speech in the United States and not, not just uh, emanating from the universities, but big tech uh, as well. Um, we could talk about that, but, but I do wanna pick up on the point about um, um, Confucianism as, as a resource. Um, and this will give me an opportunity to, um, uh, uh, to say something about it, the report of the Commission on Unalienable Rights, um, which also faced the difficulty given the moment in which we issued the report about six weeks after uh, the killing of George Floyd, in uh, and, and a moment in which liberal democracy in the United States was being called into question by uh, by significant and influential voices. Yeah, uh, one of the criticisms of, of our report um, was that, um, is that it went in the wrong direction. We already have a human rights project and why do we have to go and try to ground it in America's, America's national traditions? And early on in the commission's work, um, Marianne Glendon, through the commissioner's attention to uh, a symposium that Jacques Maritain convened uh, under, uh, under the direction of UNESCO in 1947. A philosopher's symposium and the uh, uh, intellectuals from uh, around the world, not just the West, Hindu, Hindu world, Muslim world, and the Chinese world, come back to this. And the question was, um, is it consistent Conceivable that peoples and nations of the world um, can agree on any set of core principles, core, uh, core human rights. And 
the result, Mary Tane summarized the result in two propositions. Yes, it's possible the peoples and nations of the world can agree on a, a, a small set of core principles or rights who, who, whose violation is simply unacceptable. But it was not reasonable to expect that the peoples and the nations of the world would justify those core principles in the same way. Americans, the West might reason to them in one way, people uh, and other civilizations in another way. Um, the contribution of the philosophy, philosophy professor of China was extremely interesting. Um, first, he observed that, uh, um, well, it's difficult to speak about human rights in Chinese. In fact, the term has only been recently coined and it was a combination, he said, a word for power and interest. Maybe there's another term uh, in 2021. Of course, as we read that, we think, well, human rights is a relatively new term in the West as well. We once spoke of natural rights, now we speak of human rights. And then he, he made this point about, uh, about Confucian, um, Confucian thinking and the obligation of the ruler to rule on behalf of the people. And that when rulers didn't rule on behalf of the people, the people were justified in seeking a new ruler. Well, his point was not, you see, Confucius agrees with Thomas Jefferson, but his point was, as I think in a way you're suggesting, um, within Confucianism, there are resources, moral, philosophical re resources that, um, that certainly provide a, a counterweight to uh, the Chinese Communist Party, provide us with standards for criticizing, provide Chinese people for, in, you could say, internal standards for criticizing. And it should be, um, um, we, should un we should understand that as well, but also um, constrain our efforts to impose one way of protecting human dignity on, uh, on, on all others. And wh while we, um, we hope that everybody recognizes the claims of human dignity, we should also recognize the variety of ways to, to reason to it. I'll stop there. Okay, Tom Palmer, Jonathan Hartley, Andy Zwick, and Avi Nelson, make it quick. I will. Um, <laughs> I'll make it quick too. P Peter, thank you so much great for your great you, work. Um, I, great to see you. I, I am very fearful of China and I shuddered when Biden said they were our friends and weren't a threat and all. Um, but most of the people who articulate the threat like you do uh, also add that we were we made a mistake by embracing China uh, in the market sphere with the expectation that great things would follow and human freedoms politically and so forth. And I, I don't know that we had an alternative. I think of the hundreds of millions of people as I understand it who were taken out of poverty largely through that, um, which isn't our benefit, but certainly is our benefit in a way in, in the sense that it is a benefit to the whole world. And um, I just wondered what you thought about that. Did we make a big mistake? And, and certainly we should have recognized the threat earlier, but yeah. did we make a mistake yeah. by doing what we did? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm very grateful for that question because I, I spoke loosely. Um, I think it, it's unfair to say in the early 1970s was a mistake. The decision was, was motivated by reflection on complex geopolitical circumstances, um, questions about least bad options with, um, with an awareness of, uh, at the time, the overwhelming importance, the overwhelming urgency of, of the Soviet threat. So um, no, I, do, I think it would be um, really an, an expression of er arrogant hindsight to suggest that had we been there in the early 70s, early in the 1980s, we would have been reading um, uh, Mao and his successors and, and we'd be recognizing that the continuing professions of Marxism, Leninism mean this extraordinary economic liberalism can produce political uh, liberalization. So no, I don't want to them that, but as you suggested, I do think that, um, that it did take us too long to correct course. But, but in any case, what's most important now is to recognize that, uh, that the CCP seems, with all of its vulnerabilities, seems, seems determined uh, not only to maintain an authoritarian grip on 1.4 billion people in China,
but to import its authoritarianism, and that's, sorry, to export its authoritarianism through the means I've described, and countering that, that export is crucial to securing freedom. Thank you. Thank you, John Smartly. Unmute yourself, please. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks so much, Peter, for your talk. Um, given that, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like political liberalization in China isn't you know, happening anytime immediately soon, I think the, the worst sort of thing in my mind that's going on is, you know, what's happening in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs, um, which you highlighted. I'm curious what your thoughts are on, on the future of the Xinjiang uh, detention camps. You know, these started in 2017. Uh, you know, there were U.S. sanctions put into place last July on uh, imports uh, from Xinjiang and, and on a few companies and individuals in particular, um, just as you know, the Trump administration um, uh, concluded uh, with um, Pompeo declaring uh, genocide. It seems like Secretary Blinken is, is upholding that term. What's next for Xinjiang policy? How much longer do you think China can get away with you know, running you know, detention camps with a million, you know, somewhere estimated to be over a million people. Um, like how, how long, like what, what do you think that the future is as far as um, policy engagement and um, the, the existence of those camps? Thank you. Um, uh, it's a great question. And uh, alas, I don't have a good answer to it. Um, it's a, look, it's a, it's a huge problem, um, all but unprecedented. When before has uh, the United States State Department um, issued an official finding of genocide while maintaining um, extensive and intensive commercial relations with the country and understanding that um, all of our friends and allies are going to do the same, in fact, even more so, some of them even, even more so. Um, where, so um, the, the, you're right, Secretary Blinken has, seems to have embraced the State Department uh, finding. And by the way, the, uh, the Blinken State Department knows, not how, knows how to repudiate findings of the Pompeo State Department. Within uh, two hours of the inauguration of President Biden on January 20th, the Blinken State Department had taken down both the report of the Commission on Alienable Rights and the uh, Elements of China Challenge paper from the policy planning website. that They know how to um, uh, set, set aside, but, but Secretary Blinken ha has not done that. So um, the United States uh, will have to use all elements of its diplomatic toolbox. That involves um, speeches. Uh, it involves convening groups to bring to the attention of the world the ongoing commission of crimes against uh, humanity and genocide. Um, it involves uh, it involves sanctions. Um, uh, it involves uh, it actually also involves upholding uh, the rule of law wh wh wherever we can. How far can the United States press? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what uh, uh, what the. State Department's uh, next steps will be. But, but to be fair, I can tell you this, it would have been an extraordinarily vexing problem for um, a second uh, Trump administration and for, uh, for a Secretary Pompeo uh, going in. We, we are fated to continue to cooperate with, um, with China. It's our number two or number three trading partner. Um, it's the same for South Korea, for Japan, for Australia, for, for for India. There's no, um, decoupling is a bad word. You heard a lot about it uh, in the spring. Uh, decouple, decoupling is a bad word because it suggests the possibility of a radical break. You're a couple, you decouple, you're no longer a couple. It, do, it doesn't mean that you uh, see each other every, uh, every other night. Um, uh, Senator Cotton's office has recently come out though with a paper tries to um, but the middle and speaks of the need to develop initiatives of quote, targeted decoupling. So uh, that seems to me to be right. We select uh, specific uh, industries, uh, especially in the high tech realm, especially with uh, essential goods. 
and we try to reduce our reliance on, on China. That, that's both in our national security interest, but it's also a kind of sanction for, uh, for, these, cr for these crimes. Um, but I, I, I regard it as um, among, the most, uh, among the most vexing issues because of our, the extraordinary economic entanglement of, the, of not only the US economy and the Chinese economy, but of the economies of all friends and partners. Uh, sorry, I don't have a better answer. Andy and Avi. Peter, thanks for your talk and great to see you. I wanted to ask you about- Great to see you, Andy. I wanted to ask you about the coronavirus pandemic and the net effects for China, both relative to the US and relative to the US and our allies as a whole. You mentioned in um, passing, for example, the cover up. Yeah, uh, yeah. So did, yeah, does yeah. China pay a price right. is sort of what's behind yeah. my oh, question. Yes, yes. Um, I think China did pay a price, but I should also make clear that uh, that discontent with China ha had been growing. So I, I was named director in the summer of 2019. In September of 2019, I visited New York on the occasion of uh, 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 UN General Assembly Week, the week that marks the opening of the new session of, uh, of UNGA, which it turns out is a very big deal in the diplomatic world. And I had uh, numerous conversations with counterparts. Um, especially from Europe, getting to know conversations. And one after the other, they explained to me that um, we wouldn't be having this particular conversation a couple of years ago. What do you mean this particular conversation? A conversation about China. I said, really? I said, yes, Britain, France, Germany. Um, yes, it's, uh, in, but uh, we want to assure you, they would say in the last couple of years, <clears throat> we've come to recognize too, the urgency and centrality of the China challenge. Now, of course, I, I, I could have said, and I, I hope I did, <clears throat> actually, it's only recently that the United States has. Um, if you go back and look at um, first year of the Trump administration, when Rex Tillerson was Secretary of State, you wouldn't have said, I think, that the number one priority of the uh, Trump administration foreign policy is reorientation of the State Department. So it's relatively new to China. This is not to suggest that China hadn't loomed large, but the kind of attention that Mike Pompeo gave to it, something new. My European friends insisted it was, it's come into focus for us as well. As your question suggests, Andy, yes, things did change after the, uh, after the global pandemic. Um, I, I heard more, more than one head of policy planning or foreign minister utter words to the effect, that's it, we're done. We recognize that these are, uh, to, to, use, um, to use a term that um, favored by Secretary Pompeo, that uh, the CCP is a malign actor on the world stage. Right? We, we understand there's no radical decoupling. We understand we're dependent on them, but we also understand uh, what the number one threat is. So uh, how, how did we put it? Uh, Secretary may have put it in a speech that, um, um, that the, the virus, the global pandemic did not, did not constitute an inflection point, a change in direction, but it represented an acceleration of a trend that was already in place. By the way, for, for companies as well, many companies as well. Uh, so, um, so that that's the bottom line. Not an inflection point, but it accelerated a trend that is a growing appreciation of um, uh, of the efforts of the CCP to transform uh, international order and uh, a crystallization of an appreciation of their um, their contempt for human rights, their disregard for the welfare of other peoples and other nations. I'll stop there. Thank you. Avi, please. Was the tariff policy that the Trump administration imposed, was that successful? Could there have been a different approach? And what should the United States be doing now with regard to Taiwan? 
<laughs> okay. Um, um, the, the terror approach, I think uh, we can now say was modestly successful, could have been done better. So a different approach, um, probably, but it was sort of baked in for Donald Trump. Remember, uh, Trump in one sense in 2016 um, did run against um, China. He put China at the center, but not in the same way that Secretary Pompeo has. For Donald Trump in 2016, the issue was exclusively trade. So he was um, uh, electorally, it put him in a, in, in a position to pursue um, to pursue this uh, the, the the trade deal from uh, I guess they signed phase one in January 2020. Um, but what it wasn't the heart of Secretary Pompeo's understanding. Uh, yes, there's um, there's more to be done on trade. What's uh, what I what I think to a touchy uh, very touchy issue. I think the Trump administration could have done more. To, um, uh, to make the point that was sometimes made that um, that what what we were seeing was not a uh, new protectionist re regime, um, but measures to ensure that the Chinese would play by the rules, rules of fairness uh, um, and transparency that are that are built into the rules based international order and that are the foundation of. Uh, of our free market system and what we hope is a um, what what is a successful free trade uh, free trade regime. Taiwan, <laughs> um, it has as you know it's been uh, the long-standing policy of the United States that um, uh, that uh, that the circumstances of China and the circumstances of of Taiwan should not change except through negotiations by, uh, by the two sides. Uh, that said, the administration um, uh, initiated an economic dialogue with Taiwan. The Trump administration increased the quantity and quality of weapons being sold to Taiwan. The Trump administration um, uh, sent uh, highest level uh, cabinet official and highest level State Department uh, official to Taiwan for uh, for various uh, meetings and ceremonies. So um, I think we um, we strongly indicated, and the Taiwanese understand that um, that we appreciate the threat they face uh, following, uh, especially following China's uh, in violation of its international obligations its crushing of freedom in uh, Hong Kong, and in violation of its uh, international obligations, its building up of positions in, uh, in the South China Sea, and its arming, arming itself uh, with, uh, and I, I, going back to a question David asked, I didn't mean to um, diminish the significance of China's military, and it's arming itself with, a, with not only a formidable Navy, but, um, Really uh, vast uh, missile systems that um, that could be used in in the event of um, an effort to impose its military will on on Taiwan. So again, this in a way is a question like um, uh, like the question about um, uh, um, policy toward a country, a, a great power competitor, which is committing genocide. What is um, beyond uh, the the various ways I've indicated that we strengthen the relationship with Taiwan. Um, what would the United States do if China made a move on Taiwan? Uh, I don't know what uh, the Biden administration will do. Uh, um, I know it would have put uh, would have put the Trump administration in a very difficult position. Um, uh, I'll only uh, make one more observation. Um, on the one hand, um, speaking only of conventional military forces, if the Chinese were determined to uh, impose their will on, on Taiwan, speaking only from a conventional point of view, it would be very difficult in the conventional plane for the United States to repel Chinese forces. Uh, 
given the closeness of, of uh, People's Republic of, of, of China to Taiwan and their formidable forces. On the other hand, um, in light of the various vulnerabilities and instabilities that we've uh, earlier talked about, um, Xi Jinping, uh, see, it's reasonable to suppose that she wouldn't want to um, too early uh, show his hand and make a move because uh, it's reasonable to suppose that even if the United States couldn't repel military force, um, uh, the United States and Taiwan together could uh, exact a very high cost, would, which could conceivably further destabilize uh, Xi's hold on power. Um, bottom line is, I'm not really sure what to do about the Taiwan problem. Uh, Peter, I think we have to stop. And, I have a question. Uh, so, um, my wife has a question. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you'll hang around for... <laughs> <laughs> for your wife's question, I'm hanging around. For, for a, a few moments, but uh, it's been great having you. And it's a wonderful, Thank you. a joy to see you again. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harvey. I enjoyed the conversation. <laughs>